Carrie and I got married six years ago. Everyone describes their wife in these stories as something exceptional, and I can understand that because I've had a bit of time to think about it. My M. Carrie was a real looker, no doubt about that, exceptional. I don't know. I know I fancied her. I known Carrie for a long time since we were teenagers, in fact. I was a few years older than her, though. So for me, she had always been just the young girl down the street then. When she was 14, something happened that seemed to lock us together. I was just about to go off to university and had left my pals after an evening in the pup. It wasn't too late. But it was just getting dark when I took a shortcut through the local park just as well. I did maybe because I came upon young Carrie being annoyed by a couple of boys of about her age, I say annoyed, but it was more serious than that. And if I hadn't come along at that moment, then who knows what might have happened. Well, her version has always been that I waited in like some hero and saved her, but the reality was that once I confronted the two BLS, they took fright and took off either way. I became something special to her, and for the rest of the summer, I kept noticing her not quite following me around, but certainly doing her best to be wherever I'd be. My pals took the piss, of course, as at 18 I was far too old for her. But even then, I had to admit, she was a very pretty young girl with even at that age the most superb pair of long, shapely legs. Then I went off to study for three years and hardly saw her again till I went back after graduating and spent a long summer there before I went off to my new job by then. Of course, it was her who was 18 and me nearly 22, a somehow different kettle of fish altogether, which matched up with quite what a beautiful young woman she had matured into made her continuing affection for me extremely acceptable. We got together and became boyfriend and girlfriend, walking hand in hand in the park and kissing and cuddling whenever we had the chance. By then I was hardly still a virgin, but she was, and despite several near misses, that is what she remained. That's not to say that I didn't make myself acquainted with the wonderful softness of her body. But that was it. It didn't worry me too much, as underneath I still imagined myself as her protector, and Carrie still told people about the time I had saved her from a fate worse than death. I'm pretty sure Carrie fell even more deeply in love with me that summer, and in all honesty, I couldn't have been far behind, but it wasn't to be, not then at least. And despite openly discussing other possibilities, we sadly parted company as she went off to Leeds Metropolitan University and me to my first serious job in Bristol. We couldn't have been much further apart. She swore to be faithful to me, but I took that with a pinch of salt. I just spent three years as a student myself and was well aware of how things change and what temptations there were. I did visit her a few times, but the last time it was so obvious that she had another life to worry about and we simply drifted apart that could have been it, of course, as I certainly didn't hang around becoming for a few years a bit of a party animal on the Bristol scene and going through a succession of different girls. But then I changed my direction a little and ended up back near her home, and Carrie came back into my life. She graduated by then and was working already when her parents invited me round. I have to say that the first welcome I got from darling Carrie was a little less warm than I expected, but that soon changed indeed. She had changed herself, had grown up, become more sophisticated, more worldly-wise, and yes, she had lost her virginity. And unfortunately, it hadn't been to me, no matter really. And who was I to complain? Then one evening she told someone I was still her special hero, and we seemed to be back where we'd left off. I renewed my acquaintance with her, and this time we didn't stop there. We were soon screwing away like bunny rabbits, and the more we made love, the more we fell in love. Marriage followed as sure as morning follows night, and six years later we were still as much, much in love as we ever had been. Carrie was. Sometimes a bit of AUD didn't approve of all manner of things, but never pushed her views too far, so it never was a problem. We were happy, really happy, and the future looked bright. My problem started when my company decided to promote me no problem with that, except that it was to the fine city of Leeds where my loving wife had spent her years at the university. It was that or the Middle East. And since we wanted to start a family, Leeds just seemed to make more sense no problem there either at least not for the first couple of weeks while we found ourselves a temporary rented flat and settled in, I knew I'd miss going to watch Arsenal play football, and Leeds City was hardly going to replace them in my affections after all Billy Breyer and crew had long since retired, but overall Leeds seemed not a bad place to be in for those of you who don't know it. It is a very lively city with lots of nightlife. 
Then one evening, she suggested that we do a bit of a tour of the city and look in on a few of the places she used to, to frequent as a student. We had a drink in a few of the student pubs, but even Carrie felt a bit out of place, since it had been eight years since she had graduated from Leeds Matat. We ate at a restaurant where she had worked for a while, but even there, she found nobody that she remembered. Even the decoration had changed, and it was obvious that she was feeling a little disappointed with the evening it simply didn't have the magic that she had been hoping for. Strange just how a little thing like a place for decorating since you were last there can really make someone so utterly disappointed the whole evening looked as if it was going to end so poorly. I know she declared at last there was a little pub on the edge of town that I worked in during my final year. It wasn't a student pub, so maybe some of the locals will still be around. It was still early evening, so we walked hand in hand through the city center like the two lovers we were not bothering with the car, till at last she led me down a couple of back alleys, and the nature of the buildings began to change from bright city lights to shabby backstreet houses and crumbling work workshops. Was it like this when you were here? I asked Carrie doubtfully, and she laughed, telling me that it hadn't changed. She lived not far away in some cheap flat that she had shared with three other girls, one of whom had worked in the same pub as her for some time, just around this corner. She told me at last the joy in her voice so obvious that it made me grin, and then there in front of us was a grimy-looking pub that I wouldn't normally have dreamed of going in on my own, no matter with Carrie the way she was dressed, not that she was dressed or anything, is that simply wasn't her style. Carrie was the epitome of smart in her appearance, from her neatly short-cut dark hair to her smart suits and formal high heels that evening was an exception, and she'd worn a short skirt not very short at all, but for her just a little more daring than normal. I joked that maybe it was to remind her of her student days, but on reflection, just perhaps she had some idea of how the evening was going to pan out. Maybe not, though. No, I think if she'd known then. She wouldn't have left out flat, the Rose and Crown, the pub was called, with two typical big period etched multicolored windows to the front that no doubt looked very fine in their day. You sure this is it? I queried hesitantly. Of course, she replied, not so bad once you get inside with that. She flashed me a beautiful smile, the one I loved so much since I'd known her as a young girl and pushed open the pub door. Little did I know at the time that I would never feel the same again about that smile I followed her in, and she was right, the interior was old-fashioned, but quite clean, with a long, dark wooden bar and a lovely old mirror behind, and the windows that looked so grubby from outside actually looked fine from within as the lights from the street lamp shone through them, giving the bar a warm sort of glow. Carrie stood there, entranced at last recognition registering on her face. It hasn't changed a bit she said quietly to nobody in particular. I shouldn't think it's changed much in 50 years, I added, which made her giggle a little and squeeze my hand as she looked lovingly up at me. Oh, look, Terry, look, and she was off, letting go of my hand and scooting across the wooden floor to the other end of the bar. Hi there, remember me? I heard her say to the barman who turned round to look at her. He looked her up and down, appraising the pretty young woman in front of him. Then a smile came to his face as he recognized who had just greeted him. Carrie, he cried, is that really you? Carrie Carrie stood there nodding her head in confirmation, grinning up at the tall, lanky barman whose name I never discover. I couldn't help grinning myself as I realized that at last Carrie had found someone who remembered her, and the evening wasn't going to be a total waste after all. He hooped with some sort of joy and rushed from behind the bar, taking Carrie in his arms and cuddling her tightly, kissing her full on the lips. The cuddle and kiss didn't last long enough for me to get jealous or anything, but the first uneasy feeling slithered coldly through my gut. Removing the grin from my face, they talked animatedly about things I knew nothing of, and I waited to be introduced. The talk passed on to people who Carrie had obviously known back then, and I still waited in vain to be introduced when another guy walked into the pub, the barman called out to him and told him to come and see who turned up. He walked straight by me and yelled Carrie as soon as he spotted her again. I had to endure my wife being cuddled and kissed by a man I'd never seen before again. I waited in vain to be introduced. Carl will be in any moment, Carrie, the second guy told her, and to my amazement she blushed, thought that would get to you. He added, seeing her reaction really answered, Carrie Carl still comes, and does he heck really be here soon? Who the hell was Carl Carey had never mentioned to Carl before? No reason why she should, of course. 
But I didn't like the way the evening was heading, and I didn't like the way she was ignoring me either. I was still left there standing on my own, feeling like a spare prick. I cleared my throat to attract her attention, and when that failed, I coughed loudly. The barman looked around at me, but Harry continued to ignore me deep in conversation with the other man. Sorry, mate, the barman called over to me. I'll be with you in a minute. What could I do? I could have gone and grabbed her arm or something, but she was so obviously lost in the fun of meeting her old friends that I decided to bide my time walking up to the bar just behind them and leant on the counter. Yes, mate, asked the barman at long last, tearing himself away from my wife. What can I get you a pine of best please, I told them, and whatever the lady wants, the smile left the barman's face as I said it. I don't think this little lady takes drinks from just anyone, miss. He snarled at me, evidently totally unaware that I was her husband, or that she was even with me. I think, Sheck, have a drink with me. I responded, my temper just beginning to rise. Now look here, mate. The barman started. You can't come in here. And it was as far as he got, however, as... At last, Carrie turned round the raised voices, at last attracting her attention, and interrupted him. It's okay, he's with me, she informed the other two casually, hardly bothering to so much as look over at me. The barman shut up, but still scowled at me as he pulled my beer. That will be 220, then he demanded, as he pushed the glass over the counter towards me and the drink for the lady. I queried that's on the house, he brosely informed me, then promptly asked her what she wanted and poured it for her without looking back at me. I stood there sipping my pint, wondering what the hell was going on. My wife was still deep in conversation with the other two, laughing and giggling for all she was worth, as they recounted old stories, and they told her what had happened since she had left Carl's name cropped up several times, I noted, and a worrying smile flitted across Carr's face each time she still continued to completely ignore me, and I was beginning to get quite upset at her strange behavior. I was about to step in between them to reclaim my wife's attention when the pub door opened in a too big chap's breed in one of them white and the other a West Indian. Hey, Carl shouted out the barm in the instant he spotted them look, who's turned up out of the blue, so this was the mysterious Carl Big Sod and rather tough looking with it as well. Carl stopped in his tracks when he spotted Carrie and a huge grin creased his face. Bugger me, Carrie, he shouted. Where have you appeared from? Without saying anything more, he bounded past me, and as the others moved out of his way, grabbed her and embraced her, Carrie kissing him back as enthusiastically as he was kissing her. This time it did go on a bit too long for my liking, and the way the others stood there beaming at the two of them as they were locked together didn't help either. Then his left hand dropped down her back and cupped the cheek of her bottom. I'd had enough, I stepped forward to break it up, deciding that if Carrie was going to allow that and couldn't even so much as involve me and her friends, then it was time we were going. I only managed one step forward and was brought to a sudden stop by a large, strong hand on my shoulder, gripping me hard. Wouldn't if I were you, mate, came a deep voice from behind me as I realized the black guy had anticipated my move and stepped forward to prevent it. Get your hand off me! I told him angrily, trying unsuccessfully to throw him off. All four guys turned on me at that point, all squaring up at me, expecting trouble. Oh, leave him alone, Carrie told them before anything happened. He bought me here tonight. He's okay. He won't cause any problems all this without so much as even looking at me or acknowledging me in any way. Her head turned towards me for a moment, but her eyes never met Botter. Here did I no mention that I'd known her since she was a kid and that I happened to be her bloody husband. Stay cool, man. The big black guy told me more than a hint of a threat in his voice. He let go of my shoulder, but eased me back away from the group around Carrie, inserting his huge frame between them and me. I couldn't believe what was happening. An icy cold lump started to form in my gut. Twenty minutes ago, I had been hand in and with my loving wife, almost skipping happily through the middle of Leeds city center, as much in love as any couple could be, that of this in twenty short minutes left on the sidelines, and shut out by my wife and her friends, they made a move over towards one of the tables as the pub started to get busy, I saw several attractive, if looking women come in and talk to Carl or his sidekick before going out again or taking their place at the bar. I wasn't such an innocent abroad not to recognize exactly what the women were or to be more precise what they did for a living. Bloody hell, my somewhat prim and correct young wife was being friendly with a pimp he must have been. 
Carl must have been a bleeding pimp. Surely she wasn't so simple-minded not to recognize what was going on around her enough whether she liked it or not. Carrie and I were getting out of there, Carrie. I called sufficiently loudly that she couldn't pretend not to hear time we were going. Carrie, come on now, underscore, 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 it's time we were off. She looked over at me and the smile drained away from her face only to be replaced by an agitated look. She didn't even say no, she didn't say anything at all. Carrie just shook her head at me and turned back to her friends, the smile returning, and before long, she was giggling like a little schoolgirl, apparently having forgotten that I was even there, play it cool or piss off, man, said the deep voice at my elbow, I won't warn you again now. Look here. I started to protest, but he put his huge hand on my chest and pushed me firmly away from the group set around the table and back up to the bar. The lady doesn't seem to want to know you, buster. He informed me, stay there and wait for her if you want or go home. Go find yourself another date for the night or better. Still try one of our ladies without waiting for me to say anything. He beckoned one of the women over and she responded immediately, trotting over on her high heels to stand right beside me. This is Sally. He told me it'll cost you, but she'll look after you tonight. Just piss off with her and forget about the little lady over there. Her and Carl have a lot of catching up to do. Sorry if your date didn't work out as you expected tonight, but that's life. He backed off and went back to the table, leaving me speechless with rage. Don't push your luck, handsome, the prostitute Sally advised me. The pair of them are not to be messed with, just let her go. She's pretty enough, but better to find yourself another girl for the night. I looked at her in disbelief. Sheck, not my girlfriend. She's my bloody wife. I found myself hissing at her. Oh, the girl, Sally exclaimed, her face clouding over. Oh, that's bad. That's really bad. I want to make my move back over to the table, but this time it was Sally who blocked my move. Hang on, handsome, she said to me. You really don't want to do that. What the am I supposed to do then, for Christ's sake? I demanded in frustration. Let me go and have a word with her for you. She offered, you're not kidding me, are you? She really is your wife. The look on my face alone was enough to convince her, and holding up the palm of her hand towards me to make sure I didn't follow her, she slowly threaded her way through to the table where Carrie and the others were sitting. I watched as she bent down and whispered something in Carr's ear, and then Carrie looked up in my direction for the first time since she'd entered the pub, her eyes meeting mine. It was almost a look of surprise as she looked over at me as if she'd really and truly just remembered I was there. She looked sheepishly away and then whispered something back to Sally. She said she'd come over and see you in a minute. Sally informed me when she got back over to me in a minute, in a bloody minute I shot at her. I want her here now, don't push your luck. Mister was all she said back. And then she wandered off to try her luck with another John further down the bar. I stood there fuming, unable to take my eyes off Carrie for a minute, unable not to notice that Carl Arm had slid across her shoulders, the tips of his fingers brushing casually against one of her breasts. At least she looked over at me a few times with a watery smile for my benefit. I started counting the minutes, wondering at which point I would explode. But after five minutes, she stood up and excused herself, but didn't come straight over to me. Instead, Carrie made her way over to the toilets and disappeared through the door. I didn't know whether she wanted me to follow her or not. I didn't know what the hell to do. But before I could make my mind up, she came out again, and with a glance over towards Carl's group, made her way over to me. What the hell are you playing at? Carrie, I demanded angrily. Letting go and go, now I want to grab her arm, but she pushed me off backing away. Don't cause a scene. Terry, she spat out at me. You can go if you want, but I'm staying here for a while. What you heard me? Terry Carey told me firmly, I'm staying here for a while to chat to my old friends. You can go and come back later for me or stay here and wait. I looked at her, unable to believe my ears. The woman who had told me how much she loved me several times earlier that day was telling me to piss off better if you just go home. Terry, she continued when I failed to respond. I'll get a taxi back later. We'll talk about this. Then I'm not bloody well leaving you here, Kate Terry. I cried. I very nearly did cry, in fact. Then just stay and watch, then. Terry, if you must. She answered resignedly, you might not like what you see, but for your own sake, don't interfere. I tried once more to persuade her to leave with me, but she would have. None of it better if you left now. Terry, she suggested, I'll see you later. 
Don't worry, sweetheart. Everything will be okay afterwards. I love you and we'll make it up to you, I promise. Just give me this one evening and everything will be like... Before Carrie made move away, but I grabbed her arm and pulled her back, astounded at her outrageous behavior. I didn't even see him coming before I knew it. I was flat back up against the bar as the big black guy knocked my arm away from my wife and me with it. I'm no wimp, so I took a swing at him, but I might as well have tried to knock down Nelson's column. He shoved me further along the bar and then pushed me to the ground. I warned you, you stupid little bastard. He reminded me a nasty grin on his face. Then he picked me up as if I was a featherweight and propelled me towards the door. Don't hurt him, Ted cried out Carrie. He hasn't done any real harm. I don't really know whether her pleas had any effect on the outcome, but at least I guess she had tried the next thing I knew I was outside and doubling up as he hit me in the stomach and then reeling backwards as he punched me in the chest. It felt as if I'd been hit by a train and I fell flat on my back and waited for the beating to continue. It didn't come. I lay there for a good while wondering how the hell I had got there. I had a pain in my chest from where he had hit me and was fighting for my breath due to the blow to my middle two punches, just two casual punches, and I had been reduced to a wreck aching all over and still unable to stand up another ten minutes, and I was able to pull myself up to my feet, shaking off the dust and grime from my clothes. How could an evening that had started so wonderfully have descended that far again? It was the same thing, I just didn't know what the hell to do. I'm no softy. But how could I stand up a great hulk like that? He'd murder me. I'd never felt so damn humiliated and hopeless in my entire life, some bloody special hero I was. It wasn't as if I even knew anyone in Leeds. I didn't so much as have a friend to call to help me. I stood there and watched the slow stream of clients going in and out of the pub, more than a few of the guys going in and coming out later with one of the women on their arm. The pub was a bloody brothel. My wife of six years, who only that morning I had discussed having children with, was in effing brothel she'd taken me there and must have known I fought back the tears and knew what I had to do. I couldn't walk away and leave her there like that. I didn't know what I was going to do with her, but I couldn't walk off and abandon her if she didn't come home with me this time. Then potentially our wonderful, perfect marriage was over. I guess more than an hour had passed before I managed to get myself ready to go back inside the pub. I didn't know what to expect. I certainly never expected what confronted me. I guess maybe you might describe it as an impromptu strip tea act. It was my wife and another girl. My wife had the last shred of clothes on her, and that was about to go off a large group of guys surrounded the pair of them, grinning and laughing as Carr's last clothes were off. No, no, I couldn't stand it. I charged forward, pushing my way. Through the other men and grabbed at Carrie, who looked round at me, a startled look on her face. Oh, no, Terry. Oh, for Christ's sake, no was all she managed to get out. I fared no better than the last time, and the light started to go out for me as someone smashed me hard in the face. The last thing I remember seeing was Carl clutching my wife in his arms. I think she had a look of horror on her face as she watched me being dragged out of the pub. They weren't so easy on me the second time, and it was several hours later that I fully came to in the middle of a car park some distance from the pub I heard all over. But I guess they were experts. And though I was in pain, nothing seemed to be broken. It took me an hour to find my way back to our car, and another before I managed to start it and drive back to out new rented flat. I fell asleep on on the sofa not knowing. And by then, beyond caring at what time Carrie would be home the following morning, I woke up feeling worse than death. I had a very long, very hot shower, and at last my body started to feel like it belonged to me again. I got slowly dressed, trying not to think of the previous evening, but I just couldn't stop. I didn't know if the pain in my body was as bad as the pain in my brain was my marriage over. I had no idea, but it seemed pretty likely for the life of me I couldn't understand what had happened. How could my loving wife Carrie have acted like that? I'd known her all those years, but quite obviously not as well as I thought 11 o'clock in the morning, and where the hell was she? I was buggered if I was going to chase back over there to find her another hour passed, and still no news I paced around the room not knowing what to do. I was buggered if I was going back to look for her. Then the phone rang. It had only been connected the day before, and unless it was a double-glazing salesman on a cold call, then the only person other than myself who had the number number was my darling wife. Hello, I answered after picking it up. I, honey. She replied quietly. Are you okay? What do you think, Carrie? I asked her. Oh, Terry, I'm so sorry for last night. I should have known not to go back to that bloody damn pub. Where are you now, I demanded. Still at the pub. I'm ready to leave now. Terry, do you want to come and pick me up, or should I get a taxi? 
I ignored her question. So who did you sleep with last night, my darling wife? I asked Awes Takali. But she didn't answer. She didn't really have to, did she? Or did the whole pub get to screw you? Carrie, is that what happened? No, Carrie claimed urgently no. Don't be stupid, Terry. The only one was. She left the sentence unfinished. It's suddenly dawning on her what she was about to say. Neither of us said anything for several minutes, though I could hear her sobbing on the other end of the line. Please, Terry, please understand why I did what I did. Please let me come home to you and let things be as they were. I can explain, explain everything if you'll just let me just give me a chance. I desperately wanted to tell her to piss off, but this had to be sorted out one way or the other. Make your own damn way home, I told her, or get one of your boyfriends to drive you back. Oh, thank you. Terry Carr whimpered. I'll be back in half an hour, an hour at the most. It will all be okay. You'll see, everything will be okay. I slammed the phone down before she had time to say anything else. Damn it, bugger it. I loved her, but I hated her. What the hell was I going to say to her when she got back? Was I going to tell her to pack her bags, or would I take her in my arms? As it turned out, I didn't have to make that decision half an hour past. Then the full hour, the afternoon, turned into evening, and still no sign of my errant wife by 8 p.m. It was obvious she wasn't actually going to come home not that night anyway, and for me, that meant possibly not any night in the future. As each hour had passed, I had got angrier and angrier, not shouting and screaming and angry, but a with cold, calculating fury that consumed me. I put a few things in the car and drove very carefully back to the city center, hoping that I could find the pub again that Carrie had taken. Me. To the night before, after several mistakes, I eventually recognized a large factory, and just down the road, the Rose and Crown Pop parking the car just around the corner, I got out and walked towards the bar, outwardly confident, but my heart pounding away inside. I had to admit I was nervous, even physically frightened after what they'd done to me the previous night. I hesitated by the front door, not knowing what to expect. I didn't even know for sure if Carrie was still in there. I pushed the door open and went in. It was much as before, full of ruffle-looking characters and even rougher-looking women. I recognized several faces, and a couple of them looked surprised to see me. If they weren't sure if it was me from the night before, then the black eye and bruises on my face would have given it away. Haven, you had enough. Maid asked the barman on spotting me. Where's my wife, Airhole? I demanded. At least he had the decency to look surprised. Your wife, he queried, screwing his face up, car's your wife. I nodded my confirmation. Bloody hell, he said she told us you were just a date. The barman looked at me with some sympathy, remembering what had happened the night before, and possibly even more, since I had been thrown out, he knew there was going to be trouble. He didn't know what, but he knew he cocked his head to one side, indicating the far corner. When I looked over there, she was, Carrie sat on Carl's knee. Neither of them had noticed me enter, and I crossed over to them before they realized I was there. Carrie gasped in surprise and tried unsuccessfully to pull her blouse back over to cover her body. She needn't have bothered, as we'd all seen them before. Carl simply grinned at me that sort of grin when you know you've got the better of someone that was a long half hour. Carrie, I said to her, did something. Hold you up. Carrie said nothing at first just stared at me with a shocked look on her face. Piss off, wimp, spat out Carl. I'll send her home to you when I'm good and ready. Well, at least it seemed that he knew she was my wife. Please. Terry, whispered Carrie at last, finding her voice. I'll definitely be back home later. I promise you I'll come back and everything will be just fine. Carl laughed and kissed her, teasing me more than her, you go when I say you can. He spat out, never taking his eyes off me to judge my reaction. Last chance, Carrie, I said to her, ignoring his sneers. It's now or never, I thought, thought about it a lot. And I think even then, if she'd come with me, chose me over him, then I would try to work it out. Maybe we could get over what had happened so far, I wasn't sure, but maybe she looked at me pitifully, indecision written all over her face. Her eyes, her lovely brown eyes, said it all. She knew how much she had hurt me, but instead of doing what she knew she should, she was calculating how much more she could get away with. How much further could she push me and still have me come back for more? Please, Terry, be reasonable, Carrie whispered eventually, and I knew she had failed me again, and that we were finished for good. 
You know how much I wanted to see my old friends again and relive my old student days just one last time. Just hang on a little longer for me while I have my last harmless little fling, and I promise you everything will get back to normal. I really do love you, sweetie, and promise I'll make it up to you. She stared at me imploringly, her eyes begging me to agree, but I said nothing in reply. I had nothing else to say. Carrie went to say something else to me, but Carl had had enough as well. He kissed her hard and threw out even harder, and her words were transformed into a nothing. That was it. I had all the information I needed. My wife was coming back home after all, but I'd have to wait till tomorrow or maybe the day after, or the day after that fine. That was great, wasn't it? I noticed that the West Indian guy was edging over towards me, so I held up my hands and backed off, no point in getting involved in a one-sided fight with him. Again, the whole bar had fallen silent, waiting to see, see what was going to happen. But as far as I was concerned, nothing was going to happen, at least not straight away. See you all later, then I said quietly, I'm not still 14. Terry Carey burst out, I can look after myself now. Even her face fell when she saw how that hit me, her one special thing over all those years, and she was throwing it back in my face. I'm sorry, Terry, she started. I really didn't mean that, I... But I ignored her taking no notice of her incoherent apology as I backed out through the door. Carl laughed out loud again and slid her blouse right off her, reaching up under her skirt, even as I watched to rub my face in my misery. It could have been that that caused the tears to roll down her cheeks. But somehow I doubted it. I guess she still loved me in her way, and to see me humiliated like that again could have just been too much. That's what I like to think anyway, as I closed the door behind me. The silence in the pub crashed as everyone started to talk and laugh at the same time. I guess they thought they'd seen the last of me. Me strolling slowly back to my car, I opened the boot and took out the stuff that I'd put there before I left the house. Anybody watching me would have thought I was cool and relaxed, whereas actually I was fuming inside, terrified of what I had decided to do. Not knowing how it was going to turn out, I had a license for my over and under 12 bow browning shotgun I've been going to clay pigeon shooting for a couple of years by then, and though I wasn't very good at it, I figured I didn't have to be for what I had planned. I selected a handful of cartridges, making sure they were all small caliber, as I didn't want to end up in prison on a murder charge. I broke the gun and pushed two rounds and putting the rest in my jacket pocket a few moments later, and I was back outside the pub and staring at the two big engraved windows. This will wake them up, I thought, as my heart thundered away inside my jacket. This wasn't me, it just wasn't me. But what else was I to do? There was no mileage in going back in and arguing with her as she wouldn't agree, and I'd probably get enough another beating. What would I do if I simply went home, wait for her to come back to me and discuss how we might get over what she had done, how she had humiliated me, no bloody way it had gone beyond that by now, and I wasn't taking any more from any of them taking aim at the first window. I squeezed the trigger just like I'd been taught my arm was trembling, shaking even and the barrel of the shotgun was swaying around uncertainly in a large circle. As I fought to control my nerves, it didn't matter, really. As I was no more than 12 or 15 feet from the window, I increased the pressure on the trigger and resisted the urge to close my eyes. There was a loud bang, and an instant later, the whole window disintegrated in a twirling mass of broken glass. I took aim at the second window with renewed confidence, fired off the second barrel, and the other window followed suit. The report from the gun echoed round the surrounding buildings far louder than it had ever before sounded when I had shot previously out in an open field and mingled with the tinkling of fallen glass. I calmly took two more cartridges from my pocket and loaded them into the gun. Then I waited to see what would happen. I really had no idea how they would respond and almost hoped that they wouldn't. But I was ready, ready, and prepared to show them that they'd made a big mistake if they thought I was a wimp and would take what they had done to me. Lying down the doors, flew open, and several guys poured out. They stopped dead when they saw me stood there with the gun. Nobody moved. Then Carl came charging out closely, followed by his big black henchman, stupid effing bastard. He screamed at me and charged me. Maybe thinking I'd not thought to reload, maybe not thinking at all. I took careful aim somewhere around his knees as I didn't want to risk actually killing him and put pressure on the trigger. I was as cool as a cucumber, even having time to note that my arms no longer trembled and that the gun was pointing exactly where I was aiming. It time seemed to slow down. 
I had all the time in the world. I quite clearly saw the look on his face change from rage to terror as he realized that he had made a serious error of judging J.M. Maybe I had the same grin on my face that he did just a few moments before you remember the one when you know you've really got the better of someone. Bang, he went down screaming, even surprising me with the mess it made of his legs. Fair play to the black guy. He didn't even hesitate. Great courage or no brains. I'm not sure, but he didn't stop. Not. That is until the second barrel load ripped into his legs and put him down as well. The two of them lay on the ground, Carl screaming and the black guy Ted groaning aloud. I didn't even bother to reload the time my emotions were twos shot, but fortunately the rest of the crowd suddenly melted away. Everything went calm, relatively, that is, his two injured guys can make a lot of noise. It was a short walk back to the car, though my legs were so wobbly I thought I might fall over. The shotgun went back in the boot, and I gingerly started the motor and made my way home. I drove slowly and very carefully. Indeed, I thought of going into the pub to frighten the out of carry, but I couldn't. I didn't trust trust myself, and to be honest, it had terrified me doing what I'd just done, but I'd done it. Though I'd bloody well done it just as I promised myself I would, but enough was enough. Strangely, I slept well that night and woke up quite fresh black eye and bruised face still, but otherwise quite fresh, I wondered who would turn up first, Carrie or the police, to arrest me. I hadn't even put the shotgun away, and it was still in the boot of my car as it turned out Carrie couldn't turn up about 10 o'clock. I got a phone call, ask asking me if I was the husband of Carrie Bellings. Yes, I am, I replied, wondering what it was about. It was the police I've been fully expecting them to call around to arrest me that morning, not ring me about Carrie. I'm sorry, sir, but we've got her under arrest at the station. Could you come along and collect her, please, under arrest? I queried my surprise, obviously genuine. What for? For goodness' sake, prostitution, sir. He answered she was taken in last night with a group of other working girls after his shooting on the edge of town. Oh, no, that explains it. I answered. I wondered what the hell she'd been getting up to lately, coming home at all hours, I understand. Sir the policeman answered somberly. I'm sorry you had to find out this way. You'd be surprised how often this happens. I think my comment sealed her fate. It turned out that they thought they'd made a mistake with her being a bit more upper class than the other women then. When I refused to come and get her, that must have made it sound worse. She was prosecuted and found guilty, lost her new job, and would have had great trouble finding another young female graduates with a conviction for prostitution are not exactly widely sarred after by most firms. The police didn't even so much as ask me whether I owned a shotgun mine was registered to me quite openly back in Bedford, where we just moved from. But they never even checked I wasn't a suspect in any way, so why would they? But why did nobody from the pub split on me? Well, had no idea at all Carrie tried to contact me time and time again. I never met met up with her again. But I did eventually accept one of her calls after she got more and more desperate. She told me she still loved me and... All the usual rubbish I think she really did as well, and obviously was broken-hearted that I wouldn't entertain taking her back. I refused to even discuss it, and she acted a little frightened of me after I had dealt with our problem as firmly as I had carried was at least honest with me when I questioned her about Carl and her job at the pub when she had been a student. How the hell do you go from working behind the bar to what happened the other night? I demanded I said I worked at the pub when I was a student. Carrie told me I never said I worked behind the bar. Oh, bloody hell, I can't describe how I felt when I realized the implications of those few words she'd worked for that bloody Carl as one of his girls. Only then did it all make sense the hold he had over her. I'd married an ex-prostitute and would never have known it if we hadn't gone back there. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Hard to say, really. You'll have to judge for yourselves. It was her that warned me that Carl would come looking for me to sort me out himself once he was back on his feet. That is, maybe that's why nobody from the pub told the police about me as people like that sort their own problems out, he'd never find me. Of course, I backed out of the job in Leeds, which they understood after the news of my wife got out, but I took the one in the Middle East where they were happy to have me on a bachelor posting, as they're cheaper than a married couple, that's about where we came in. I suppose I got away with it. To my surprise, I actually got away with it, and they put it all down to a gangland shooting. I suppose you might be wondering what then happened to me. 
Okay, well, that's natural. As you might have imagined, I gave up clay pigeon shooting and sold my shotgun, and then took up golf instead, got quite good at it as well, and eventually got my handicap down to six. I went out with quite a few different women, but only discovered just how good my wife Carrie had really been in bed. Well, she would have been, wouldn't she? As she had worked at it, as it were, in both senses of the word. Then I met up with Angie, a lovely American woman who I met in Dubai life was fine after that. Really fine, I never inquired too deeply quite where she'd gained her experience, but I really think she was just a gifted amateur, I hoped so. Anyway, we have never married, she didn't want to, and strictly speaking, I was still married, and I still haven't bothered to get divorced. I came back to UK occasionally, but always steered clear of leads till at last I couldn't resist it. One Thursday in June found me slowly driving past the Rose and Crown, hoping that nobody would recognize me. After all that time, the fine, decorated windows had been replaced by some modern, double-glazed units. Pity, really, I'd rather like them. I sat there in my car for a while, and at last, to my surprise, a guy in a wheelchair turned up. He was a big chap, and tough-looking, but fatter than I'd remembered Carl. But of course I'd only seen him a few short times, and that had been four or five years previously. What clinched it was the big-colored man pushing him the one with the really bad, bad limp, that could only have been Ted. Then several women poured out of the pub to see Carl report to him, maybe that being easier, no doubt, than getting him up the three steep steps into the bar. They all looked rough, just like the last time I'd been there, except one of them, that is, one of them, looked a little bit different. Pretty slender, sexy, long legs. Well, yes, it could have been her, though. She looked much, much older. She still kept her hair short and was still quite smartly dressed. Her eyes had a worn-out look about them, though, and the smile that I had once loved was nowhere to be seen. She didn't look very happy at all, but I didn't hang around to make sure she was, as she'd said, not 14 anymore and could look after herself. Strange how things turn out, isn't it? If only that bloody restaurant hadn't redecorated their dining room, then maybe she would be at home right now with our children, the ones we'd never now have. I wouldn't have been any the wiser, and maybe we would have lived happily ever after, dear listeners. Help us reach 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Something super special awaits once we hit that milestone. Subscribe now and join the fun.